Never underestimate the power of God's hard work at hand. God is using people all along the way to teach and guide and mentor you. And when the time comes, God might use you then to offer a bit of wisdom for the next generation. My name is Terry Swan. I serve as the lead pastor here. And if we have not had the opportunity to meet, I'm so thankful that you're worshiping with us. Have you ever been working behind the scenes of something in your life? Have you ever been kind of on a project in which you've been behind the scenes and you've had to do all the behind the scenes work? And if you have, then you know that sometimes the very important work of behind the scenes gets overlooked. Amen? My niece is a stage manager for theater. She just turned 30 this year, so she's worked as an assistant stage director or manager for many years, primarily on Broadway, and she just recently stepped into the role of primary stage director, primary stage manager. Now, she started it all off at the Muni. She interned there for many years right out of college, and um, so she was really anticipating that first big show in which she would be the primary stage manager. Well, they told her they were going to not start her off real big. They were going to give her a little show to start with. Guess what show they gave her? Les Miserables. (laughs) Not a little show, I would say, but she works tirelessly behind the scenes, and she did a great job this year at the Muni for that. But when the final curtain call happens... She's not one of the ones out front taking a bow. She's still calling the show. And that show could not happen without all of the the behind-the-scenes people that make those things work. The stage management, the lighting, the setting, all of those kinds of things could not happen. The show could not happen without them. Well, in this sermon series, we are looking at some of the biblical characters who might get overlooked. Those sometimes behind-the-scenes people who have had a great deal to teach us about life and faith. Last week, we talked about Boaz. Do you remember his story? He is married to Ruth, and um, Boaz taught us a little bit about obedience, and not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law in which we look at God's love and mercy. And today, we're going to take a deeper look into the story of Moses, particularly around his father-in-law, Jethro, and how he works behind the scenes with support and guidance. So let's pray as we begin. Gracious and holy God, I come to you and I ask that you help me to get out of the way that your spirit might be filling this place and in this room and in these hearts. God, I pray the meditations of my heart and words of my mouth might be acceptable in your sight. Touch my mind my lips, my tongue, my voice, that I might proclaim your good news, but especially my heart, O God, that I might be transformed, that we might be transformed as a community. In Jesus' name we pray this, and all of God's children said, amen. Well, if you want to get your Bible app out, feel free to do that. Or if you brought a Bible with you, feel free to do that. As open that up to chapter 2 of Exodus. This is where we're going to first be introduced to Jethro. Now, Moses is on the run for murder. You heard that correctly. Moses is on the run for murder of a Hebrew slave who had been, been beaten. And he sees this happening and he takes his life. And even though he's been adopted by the Egyptian royal family and considered an Egyptian prince, the pharaoh has caught word that Moses has committed murder and he's seeking his arrest for execution. So Moses flees the land to Midian. And there, sitting beside a well in the middle of the desert, is where he meets his new family. So we're going to be in Exodus chapter 2, beginning with verse 16. Now, there was a Midianite priest who had seven daughters. The daughters came to draw water and fill the troughs so that their father's flock could drink. But some shepherds came along and rudely chased them away. And Moses got up, rescued the women, and gave their flock water to drink. Now, 
Even though we're not told his name right away, we hear a little bit about Jethro. He's a Midianite priest who has a large family with no sons. He has seven daughters. Seven daughters. I have two daughters. I can only imagine what Jethro's household was like and the arguments that took place in Jethro's house. Because I have experienced the arguments in our house with just two daughters. So women went to the well early in the morning. This is typical for this time. They would go to the well early in the morning or late in the evening out of the heat of the sun to gather water for their family. But we hear in this story that the daughters are helping dad out with the herd. Daughters stepping into son's roles here, and I know all about that. You see, I'm a farmer's daughter, and my older brother is 10 years older than I am, and he went off to college and then went off to a career of his own, and I became the helper, right? So I drove the tractor, I disc the field, I put up round bales, I fed hogs and cattle, I moved cattle to different fields. On a farm, when there's work to be done, it's all hands on deck, church. Everyone's got work to do. So we hear in our story today that some shepherds come over to the well, and they try to take over the well and push the women out. Women were second class. So So important, and really the essence of the story of Exodus. God heard their cry. He heard the people's cry. God remembered his people. God understood. And if there is anything we need to hear today in light of all that is happening in this world right now, it's this. God hears our cry. God remembers us that we are his children, and God understands. Amen? We need to just let that sink in. There's nothing else we hear today. It's that. God hears our cry. God remembers his people. And God understands. So how does God work in these situations where we're lifting our voices up to God and crying out to God? Well, many times God sends people who can listen, people who can guide people who understand and show care and love, God sends his messengers. 
We sometimes overlook these messengers in the midst of the greater stories of our lives. And Jethro is one of those what I call overlooked messengers. Verse 23 says it, a long time passed. Moses had spent many years now as a shepherd. Remember, he came to Midian as an Egyptian prince, the famous son of an Egyptian princess. And you can imagine his life there in Egypt. He led a life of privilege, a life of luxury as royalty. Now he was the lowest of the low. Shepherds were the lowest steps, or you could say the lowest rung on the social ladder. In fact, they didn't have any status at all. They were nothing, but not nothing to God. And not only was Moses a shepherd, but a foreigner as well. We talked last week about how foreigners were treated, what a humbling experience it must have been for Moses to go here and then end up here on the social ladder, and he had a lot to learn. Now, he had to learn the shepherd way of life from someone, right? Who do you think that was? Jethro. Jethro. Yeah, and his wife. (laughs) But Jethro. My husband, Joe, and my brother-in-law, Dale, grew up in town. They were town guys. Joe and Dale's father, Jerry, was a mechanic in a a coal mine. And Joe and Dale both married women who were daughters of farmers. Joe went the path of his father a little bit further. He's an engineer in in the mining industry. Dale went the path of his father-in-law and became a farmer. He partnered in farming with his father-in-law, and then eventually took over as primary farmer of the land. Moses' time with his father-in-law, Jethro, this time of being a shepherd, this time of learning the ways of of the people and the life and the wilderness, was God's time of preparation for Moses. God was getting him ready to, to free the Hebrew slaves and bring them out of bondage into freedom. And Jethro was part of that time of preparation. He was the messenger that was being sent to Moses at the time to help prepare him for what God was about to call. Have have you ever looked back on your life and realized that God had been preparing you for something? You can way see that easier when you're looking backwards, right? When you look back and through the rearview mirror, you can see how God had been preparing you all along for what God was calling you to do at the time, but it's really hard to see it in the midst of it. It's really hard to see it as you're going forward that God is preparing you for something. Well, when I served at Stonebridge United Methodist Church and here at Salem United Methodist Church as associate pastor, God was using that time as what I like to call my season of preparation. I had professors and mentors and colleagues that guided me along the way, and sometimes I had ears to hear and a heart open to learn, and I was ready to take in everything that they had to offer, and sometimes I had to learn it the hard way. (laughs) Have you ever been there? There's just, that's the way of life, right? That's the way for each of us. Sometimes we just learn those lessons the hard way. And I can imagine Moses had some of those life lessons. I can imagine there were times that Jethro just wanted to throw his hands up in the air and say, will that boy ever learn? I've been trying. I've been trying to teach him. I've been trying to show him the way. And yet he's trying to do something that it's not going to work. But God was using each of these moments, whatever they were, to prepare Moses for the call that he was about to make in his life, that he would be the one that would bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, if you remember the call, it did come. You can read that in the third chapter of the book of Exodus. It came from a burning bush. And Moses accepted that call. And began the journey by leaving Midian with Jethro's blessing. 
And if you remember, Moses came up against the hardened heart of the Pharaoh. There were 10 plagues as a result. But eventually the Pharaoh finally heard the words of Moses, let my people go. And Israel was torn from Egypt's grasp. Story of the Exodus. It is the defining story of the Hebrew people. It was no easy task to leave everything behind and march out through the Red Sea into the wilderness behind Moses and the pillars of cloud and fire, leaving all that they knew and heading out into a wilderness they had no idea about. Moses had been there. He knew what that was like. And it is in the wilderness where we once again see Jethro's influence upon Moses. And Moses' witness to Jethro. That's very important here. Moses' witness to Jethro. Jethro's religious background, being this Midianite priest, prepared him for responding in faith to God when he saw and he'd heard what God had done for the Israelites. And we see that Jethro worshipped God wholeheartedly. Exodus chapter 18 is where we once again see this close relationship between Moses and Jethro. Jethro is bringing the, his wife, Moses' wife, and children to him after many years wandering in the wilderness. And Moses is overjoyed to see his family. He's overjoyed to see Jethro and immediately. Moses, this is important, listened to his father-in-law and took his advice. Sometimes we have to have a humble heart to say we don't know it all, right? 
I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And Jethro could see that Moses needed to surround himself with good people. And Moses could not carry this load all by himself. Jethro probably knew this because he'd been there, done that, and bought the t-shirt. He knew all about what this was about, and he knew the importance of shared responsibilities. The wisdom of Ecclesiastes says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their hard work. If either should fall, one can pick up the other, but how miserable are those who fall and don't have a companion to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they can stay warm, but how can anyone stay warm alone? Also, one can be overpowered, but two together can put up resistance. A three-ply cord doesn't easily snap. Now we understand that the center cord in this is Jesus Christ. That a three-ply cord cannot easily snap. When we put Christ in the center of our relationships, those relationships become stronger. Amen? Amen. You can see the size of the work is never a problem as long as there's a sharing of the work. And one of the greatest leadership lessons I have ever learned is this. Delegate to others what others can do, and especially if they do it better than you. So you can focus on the things that only you can do. Amen? Amen. Let me say that again. Delegate to others what others can do, especially if they can do it better than you. You have to admit there are things in your life. I'm not good with finances. Joe handles that. Deb handles that at the church. Don't ask me about the finances. I say, Pastor Deb, (laughs) Pastor Deb. When I first started over as senior senior pastor here, Jim Kinker was the most important lay person in my life because he took care of all the finance stuff. Do that so that you can focus on the things that only you can do. Nobody is indispensable. And everybody is important. So look for ways that you can share loads with others, not only because it shares in the burden of the work, but it also shares in the blessing of the work. Because Moses listened to Jethro's advice. He did the things that only he could do. And he began to raise up the next generation of leaders. Really, that is the main responsibility of leadership and discipleship to make sure there is another that can share the good news of Jesus Christ. Never underestimate the power of God's hard work at hand and in the scenes, behind the scenes of your story. God is using people all along the way to teach and guide and mentor you. And when the time comes, God might use you then to offer a bit of wisdom for the next generation. You see... Remember, Moses learned from Jethro, but Jethro also learned from Moses. Relationships are never one-sided, church. As a church, we have to remember that there is much wisdom here for our younger generations, but just as importantly, there are things we can learn as well. We have to be willing to listen so that we can continue to be the church for tomorrow. There are Jethro's in this room, wisdom to share, lessons to offer, to be taught, but there are also Moseses in this room, the leaders that will take the church to the future generations, those kiddos that sang up here this morning, they are the future leaders that will take this church into the next generations. We have to remember, we have to remember church who the main stage director is. God. God is calling the show. And we have to remember that God is the one who will guide and direct. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's open to be transformed. I invite the band to come on back up. Let's pray together. Gracious and holy God, thank you for your love that's poured down upon each of us for 
the covenant that you have made with us that you are our God and we are your children. May we offer your love to each other and know, God, that you hear us, that you remember us, and that you understand us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.